You feel like you're at your town board meeting. I do. Mm -hmm. so I have a Hi, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today uh, for our elementary reopening forum. Uh, with us today is our Assistant Superintendent for Instruction, Mr. Timothy Backus. To uh, your left, my right, uh, our Assistant Superintendent for Human Resources and State Schools, Mr. Christopher Rubalotti. And joining us today uh, from our elementary principals, um, immediately to my left, your right, is Mr. William Dollard, Principal at Shaker Road Elementary School, and Mrs. Jill Penn, our Principal at Forest Park Elementary School. So welcome to both of you today. Uh, again, thank you for being here to our families uh, interested in our reopening. Today is Monday, July 27th. Again, we are working through our draft plans and our goal today is to provide you an overview of that draft plan um, and what is driving our reentry planning. Uh, as we've discussed in some of our earlier forums, um, our reentry plan is going to be guided by four main principles. The primary principle is to identify and protect the health and safety of all of our students, staff, family members, and our community members. That's going to be priority number one. Uh, second priority is going to be to maximize the public education benefit to all of our students. And we're looking at a plan that involves our pre-K through six students in session every day in person. We do realize that um, many parents have questions related to in-person versus remote options, but we do feel at the K-6 level that being in person every day is going to be our best option for educating our students. Our third guiding principle is again going to look at how do we sustain those programs that benefit our students in terms of extracurricular activities uh, throughout the school district. I'm going to talk a little bit about what that may look like at the elementary levels, the middle school and the high school levels. And finally, our, our goal is to continue to help control the spread of the COVID-19 virus throughout not only our school buildings, but throughout our community in general. So those four guiding principles are what are driving our committee members' work. This plan has been uh, continuing to develop over the last several months. We have uh, had an ad hoc committee of South County uh, parents, community members, um, our school administrators, Board of Education, our district office staff, our school medical director, in addition to uh, multiple teachers on the committee, who have all helped to develop and identify guidance procedures in accordance with the governor's office, the New York State Department of uh, Health, as well as the New York State Education Department. Locally, we've been working with the Albany County Department of Health uh, to adhere to the CDC guidelines as they've been attributed. Um, our overall goal is to develop a reentry plan for submission to New York State uh, for July 31st. We will continue to provide updates via our website as the reopening plan develops. Um, please keep in mind that the plan as of July 27th is still a draft. The plan uh, that will be submitted to the state by the end of this week will also be subject to approval by the governor's office and ultimately uh, reopening plans will be approved by the governor sometime in the first week in August between the 1st and the 7th. Uh, our goal for this committee again was to reimagine what South County schools would look like. Uh, we've been working for several months since our shutdown in March through the end of the school year. Uh, we do appreciate all of our families uh, for their support of our students while they were at home. We recognize the uh, challenges that this posed for many of our families having to work remotely and also educate their students in conjunction with our teachers. Our staff had worked extremely hard throughout the months between March and June to help us successfully navigate those new waters. And we've learned quite a bit from that time period. Our goal is to help put together a prescribed plan that will improve not only our in-person instruction, but in the event that we have to develop a remote model that we are better prepared to develop that remote model moving forward. So ultimately, uh, address those guiding principles and talk a little bit more about who was on the ad hoc committee uh, for the reopening. Um, in addition to our Board of Education members, we had uh, district administrators, we had elementary, middle, and high school administrative representatives. We had been representatives of our pupil services teams, both Mr. Fowler and Mr. Boardman, uh, along with uh, teachers who would advise them on items related to um, special education services. Uh, in addition, we were looking to work with our operations, our communications department, our uh, 
um, IT staff as well as our transportation staff to ensure that all of those multiple facets help to uh, create a smooth transition plan. We do recognize the health and safety starts with not only transportation, food services, as well as providing the appropriate resources for our students. In addition, we have multiple teachers on the committee representing both elementary, middle, and high school. We've sought uh, feedback from all of our instructional staff and we're continuing to gather that feedback. We will share that information out uh, in the plan forthcoming. We have surveyed um, our parents and family members, including students. Uh, we thank you for your feedback and to this date, we've had over uh, 250 individual responses with over 1,800 individual questions. And we will attempt to address as many questions as possible in today's uh, live stream. In addition, we will continue to build out our website with frequently asked questions and the answers to those questions to better inform our parents. In addition to the members I have mentioned, we also had representatives on the Governor's uh, Reopening Task Force. Uh, our own Stephanie Conklin, who's a high school mathematics teacher, was part of the Governor's Reopening Task Force uh, throughout New York State. We've had mem members of our ad hoc committee who were on regional task force, including our athletic trainer, our, our athletic director. Um, in addition, we had multiple people uh, working behind the scenes to help develop this plan in conjunction with Capital Region BOCES, our 24 United School Districts in the region. Um, we've also partnered with the Colony uh, Youth Center to provide child care. We've worked with our Colony Police, Fire, and EMS departments to adhere to um, our community partnerships with those uh, establishments to make sure that we're appropriately providing for the health and safety of all our staffs involved. So it is, it is not just a committee in isolation. We are, again, hoping to reach out to our community to provide as much feedback to the community as possible. Uh, we do thank you for your interest and we'll continue to work with you to provide uh, the updated plans as, as they are formulated. Um, the academic calendar for the 2021 school year has been established by the Board of Education during the spring of 2020. Uh, one thing I would uh, keep in mind is that there will be adjustments throughout the course of, of the fall and into the winter and spring months uh, due to potential governor's uh, executive orders that may modify whether we are in person or in remote or due to our own individual uh, needs in the district. And this may include additional staff development days to better prepare our teachers uh, for the uh, needs of meeting our students' educational needs. So we appreciate your flexibility. Well, we will continue to provide uh, as much advance notice as possible, but we did want to make you aware that the academic calendar uh, may look a little bit differently uh, than it has in past years. And uh, again, that could be directly contributed to the COVID-19. Um, one of the main portions of our plan was not only the student safety, but the continuity of learning. And I'm going to turn the presentation over to Mr. Backus to talk a little bit about what our continuity of learning plan will look like across the K-12 continuum. Mr. Backus? What we'll do is cover all the K-12. Uh, what we're looking at is having at the K-4 level, uh, it will be pods of students to get the students into um, instructional spaces that allow for social distancing, keeping them trying to keep them six feet apart. Uh, students will be encouraged to wear masks, particularly when they are not able to social distance. Uh, when they are transitioning, when they're getting on transportation, off transportation, going through hallways, things like that, the students will be expected to wear masks. When they're in the classroom and socially distance, let's see how that develops, but there will be opportunities for um, mask breaks uh, during the course of that. Uh, but they will be in pods so that they will have a certain number of students, usually around 15 in each one of those instructional pods at the K-4 level. Uh, so that will be the, what we're working on is trying to keep the students as socially distanced as we can during the course of their school day. And we'll talk about some of the specifics of this as we go through, uh, particularly with the outliers such as lunch and gym and some different things associated with that. At the 5-6 level, um, at the K-4 level, excuse me, we also plan to have the students in every day. Our goal will be to have K-4 students in every day, but have them as social distance as possible. At the 5-6 level, uh, we are also working to have the students in every day, same type of setup to where they would be in pods using every instructional space uh, in the buildings to be able to spread the students out with a variety of different teachers uh, to get them instruction during the course of the day. Uh, in addition to that, at the 7-12 level, 
Uh, we will look at putting the students on a two out of six day cycle so that they can be socially distanced. Uh, also with our middle schools, we start to run out of space uh, as we start to have the five, six uh, spread out some more. Uh, so we will be going to two out of six at the high school level. Uh, on site, the other four out of six days, they will be on remote instruction. Uh, our special education classes, in particular, our self-contained rooms uh, will be on site every day. And from the standpoint of grading, uh, we are back uh, full time. Uh, the grading policies we've had in place over time, uh, previously, previous to the shutdown would be in place. As we start to get into a hybrid model, we will take where we are at home for some instruction and we are on campus for some instruction. We will take into account a different grading model as we get into that. And then if we end up being fully remote again, uh, we learned a lot from the shutdown from March 13th on. Uh, so we'll have grading policies in place just for if we are fully remote at that point. Dr. Perry? Uh, yes, so to reinforce that same thing, Mr. Backus and uh, committee of our teachers and administrators will continue to look at the schedules as they relate to each level. Uh, those levels at K4, 5, 6 are designed to be in person with similar grading to what our expectations have been uh, in the past at the 7-12 level. Uh, we do anticipate a prescribed schedule along with the grading similar to what we've had in the past and we'll continue to message that information out. The other thing I'd say, Dr. Perry, from the physical plan as I take a look at the plan, uh, one thing to keep in mind is that similar to when you're in a supermarket nowadays since March, there will be certain pathways to follow in buildings, socially distanced markers, things like that that we even have in place in our extended school year, uh, summer school at this point. Yes, yeah, so in a, a little while, when we get into our question and answer session, I will ask our building principals, what will that look like in their building, individual classrooms? What may the hallways look like? Some of the signage that will uh, be available to help uh, mitigate the uh, traffic patterns and, and what would potentially look like for parent pickup and drop off in uh, each of our various buildings. Um, so uh, the next uh, phase of our plan is talking about uh, student activities, events, athletics. Um, as you may have been uh, made aware, uh, New York State Public High School Athletic Association in conjunction with the governor's office has put uh, high school athletics in grades 7 and 12 on pause until no earlier than September 21st. Uh, this means that uh, no activities will uh, be formally uh, going on uh, in South Colony or any school in New York State. Uh, this means our school athletic facilities and buildings continue to remain closed for sports teams and practices. Uh, so we will not be uh, looking at um, the public using our facilities during that time period. Uh, for uh, public events, uh, concerts, uh, indoor activities, um, and group sessions, those will also will be uh, postponed for the fall. Uh, we understand that this is an inconvenience and certainly uh, one that um, is a, a change from our normal procedures where we typically open up our buildings uh, for parents and family members to use our facilities to be welcomed into the classrooms, but to minimize the risk and spread of the virus. Uh, we will limit visitors to only those who have a uh, pre-planned uh, visit. Uh, many of our uh, buildings will have curbside uh, drop-off and pickup. And uh, in the event that a, a parent does need to come into the building, um, they will be asked a series of screening questions uh, very similar to um, what our staff will be asked each and every day. Um, clubs and activities will uh, continue to the extent possible uh, with smaller group environments. Uh, but we will not have uh, spectators uh, in those uh, situations. In the event that we have uh, concerts, then most likely they will be in a virtual environment in the fall until further notice. Again, more details will be coming. Uh, we will talk in a few moments, uh, Mr. Dollard, a little bit about what physical education may look like at the elementary level. We certainly understand that we want our students to be active, but safe. And we'll talk a little bit about his work with uh, his staff and the athletic department as to what the physical education programs could look like. Um, at this time, I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Rogalati. He'll talk a little bit about our employee safety and some of the protocols we've been putting in place to ensure not only our employees, but our students are safe each and every day as they return. Chris? Thank you. Uh, a big part of the guidance that came from uh, the SED and Department of Health refers to trainings. Uh, trainings including um, staff training, faculty training, student training, and we're gonna look at a hybrid, uh, blended model of those trainings, some that we'll do in person, uh, when we do have students in front of us, and others that will be done 
uh, using videos and posted to uh, our website to help families understand what uh, is going to be expected of their, their children. But it's also important to mention that our ability to continue with a plan that incorporates in-person instruction, that we need to follow the guidelines. And for some families, it may seem too extreme, and for other families, it, it may not seem like it's enough. Um, but I want to reassure you that our plans uh, in all our different areas of the school reopening are geared towards providing the safest environment possible for our staff and for our students. Um, it requires a relationship of trust, trust that uh, we're cleaning and disinfecting and doing the things we need to do. And on the flip side, that you're speaking with your children every day and talking to them about how they feel and going through the, the questions that Dr. Perry had mentioned. So we want to be united in our efforts to get our kids back into school as, as much as we possibly can. Uh, employees will be uh, wearing masks um, in their tra transitions. Students will be wearing masks in transportation and transitions as well. A big part of uh, decreasing the spread of the virus would be masks, uh, sanitation, disinfecting, the hand sanitizing stations, a uh, few simple things that we can follow on a regular basis that will help uh, keep us moving forward with in-person instruction. We also understand that we're working with children and we're going to enforce uh, the guidelines and, and make sure that students are making uh, good decisions with their masks. But we also understand, like I said, we're working with children and we're going to have conversations and we'll work through some, some of those moments that make our children children uh, so that we can all be on the same page. We're not looking to travel down a road of discipline necessarily, but we want to be consistent and we want to be um, uh, fair with our expectations and clear with our expectations. Uh, PBEs will be available, uh, sanitations, sanitizing stations, uh, both in and out of the classrooms. There'll be signage in areas that uh, Mr. Bagus had mentioned about traveling. Uh, we'll keep an eye on who's in and out of our buildings and using the pods will help with tracing opportunities. And we're certainly going to try to minimize contact with students between other pods and reduce uh, individuals from entering our building. Uh, parents would only be allowed in the building if they have um, an appointment previous to arriving. Um, families will need to be active in this conversation, uh, so we look forward to working with you and putting together a plan that we can all execute well so that our children can be uh, in our buildings, learning, um, and safe. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, in addition to the protocols for employees, we have a, a daily self-check uh, form that all employees will be required to submit and attest to. Uh, that is found on our website. We will be sharing that information out with our, our parents. Uh, we do expect that uh, this is a uh, community effort to stop the spread of the virus. This also means that we have to do our self-monitoring uh, information both in school and at home. So we're going to be asking our families to continue to self-monitor to check their child's temperature on a daily basis prior to sending them to school or on the school bus to ask those series of questions of whether or not they've traveled outside the area uh, and whether or not they're showing any symptoms that are um, along the lines of uh, symptoms related to COVID-19, stomach aches, fevers, chills that were not previously attributed to any other pre-existing conditions. Um, part of this uh, safety will also be targeted education. And I'll talk a little bit about uh, what we do in a typical year to start the, the school year. Um, and I'll, I'll ask our principals to elaborate a little bit more on that, but we do targeted education with our students Everything from how to safely uh, get off the bus, to board the bus, how to safely enter the school building. Um, we will expand upon those in terms of the COVID-19 protocols. This would include hand washing, uh, hygiene, uh, how to properly use a, a face covering, uh, how to properly remove them, uh, how to social distance and what that looks like. Uh, again, these are things that we will be working with your children in the classroom, working with our staff and providing resource supports at home so you can help your children transition from the summertime into the, the school year. Uh, in addition, we will be working with parents and providing the necessary guidelines uh, through the Department of Health on identifying the uh, symptoms of COVID-19 and what you should be looking for. This will be uh, a daily occurrence. And again, um, we expect that uh, this is a partnership between home and school. Uh, we cannot do this solely with our school staff. We have to do this as a community partnership with our parents and families and ask that our, our families be uh, uh, positive in that efforts. Uh, community safety and building access, as I had mentioned, um, our building access will be extremely limited. Uh, there will not be continuing education in the fall. 
Um, our use of our school buildings on the nights and weekends will also be uh, restricted. We will not be allowing uh, community groups to use the, the gymnasiums um, and uh, other classroom space. Um, and so therefore we're trying to make sure that people understand our, our main goal is to continue to provide a safe environment for our students during the instructional day. And this uh, does have an impact on our ability to open up our school buildings to the community. Uh, for that, we apologize for the inconvenience. We certainly understand that, but again, to meet our needs and to minimize the risk, again, not eliminate, but to minimize the risk of the spread of the virus, we will adhere to those types of restrictions. Um, overall, we'll talk a little bit about um, transportation and what that may look like for your children. Um, uh, students and staff uh, will be required to wear a mask while on the bus. Uh, they will be asked uh, to uh, adhere to a series of safety questions and we'll provide those questions for you. So please, parents and guardians, before sending your child to the bus stop, ask that question of whether or not your child is feeling well. Ask whether or not they have a fever over uh, 100 degrees or a temperature over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And if they do, please keep them home for the safety of your own child and for the safety of our school community. Um, members of the same household may uh, sit on in the bus at the same time, but our buses will be socially distanced. Uh, you, you may ask, how do we socially distance on a bus? That's essentially reducing the capacity for students on the bus. Our typical buses are 66 passengers. Uh, we will be looking at approximately 50% uh, reduction of, of uh, student capacity on those buses. So our buses will be looking at somewhere between 20 and 30 students on a, on a bus. Again, uh, looking at the number of seats, uh, wearing a mask, and then providing social distancing components in relation to the protocols. Uh, between bus runs, we will be cleaning the buses. Uh, we have special cleaning products that are uh, directly attributed to COVID-19 killing that virus. Um, all buses will have this information and have the uh, uh, proper cleaning materials to properly clean in between bus runs and uh, at the end of each day. Uh, we do encourage uh, families when possible to drive your child to school. Uh, we understand that this uh, is an inconvenience, but it's also another way to socially distance, uh, keep your child uh, away from others in a large group setting. Um, we understand that uh, uh, the uh, potential for traffic delays will continue to work with each building principal to uh, message out to our families uh, the best way to uh, adhere to those new responsibilities. Uh, food service so will look different in the fall than it has been in past years. Uh, those buffet lines that we typically have gone through uh, from elementary school up to high school will no longer be available. Uh, sc school food will be prepackaged. It'll be boxed. Um, it'll make sure that uh, students still have a selection on a daily basis for both breakfast and lunch, but it'll be either pre-wrapped or prepackaged in a box to ensure that uh, no additional hands are touching it that is essentially a touch-free environment for our food service delivery. Uh, we will provide this for students, whether they are uh, in person or in a remote, remote environment. So those students that may be in a hybrid model at the 712 level will also have access to daily food service delivery. Um, so the students can either pick up lunches or in the event that uh, lunches need to be delivered, we'll work with our transportation department to make sure that no student goes hungry uh, in the school year. Uh, these are essentially grab-and-go meal styles and more information will be provided from our uh, food service department. Uh, part of our plan is financial planning. Uh, we've been looking at the, the costs attributed to COVID-19. Uh, they are extensive in terms of uh, per personal protection uh, equipment, in terms of cleaning products, uh, additional staffing that is required to pr provide that cleaning. Uh, we are constantly looking at uh, the overall ways to be more efficient, but also with priority of safety of all students and staff. We are conscious of the fact that the governor's office has uh, considered a up to 20% reduction in state aid moving forward. At this time uh, in July, we have yet to uh, hear from the governor's budget director related to uh, what that reduction may look like, but we are anticipating up to a 20% reduction in aid for South County schools. That would be an additional $3.2 million in cuts. Uh, we're hopeful that uh, that will not uh, come into play but we are making uh, cautionary steps in our purchasing currently and managing our finances moving forward to better manage uh, overall fiscal portion of, of the budget. Uh, we do appreciate uh, all those community members who were able to uh, voice their, their vote in the FCT uh, ballot process. Uh, we thank you for 
the community's efforts in supporting our budget and supporting our investment in our, our children. So uh, thank you to the community uh, for that successful budget process. It certainly uh, makes for planning and it makes for a much more successful start to the school year. Our communications timeline will be shared via the website. Uh, just some of the items we've already been doing and some things that we'll be looking ahead to, to give you a heads up. Um, once the governor has issued uh, his directive to districts on July 13th, that they need to have a reopening plan uh, by July 31st. We have uh, continued to work with our reopening task force to adhere to that. We are currently working through the draft of those plans. We anticipate the uh, reopening task force meeting again on July 30th for a final review of the, the plan before submission on Friday, July 31st. Uh, at some point in time between August 1st and August 7th, the governor will make a determination whether or not the metrics in the region provide for safe reopening of school. Uh, that can be a reopening of school in person or it could be a reopening of school in a remote uh, environment. That is still the governor's decision at this time and we will uh, make every effort to be prepared whichever direction that uh, he makes uh, that decision on. So, so far we've uh, developed the review of the reopening guidelines. We've uh, looked at a variety of resources from our P-12 uh, learning guidelines to the Occupational Safety and Health Administration guidelines, interim guidance on public transportation, uh, New York State contract tracing guidelines, guidelines on uh, public and private employees returning to the workplace, interim guidance on sports and recreation in schools, uh, CDC vulnerable populations. We've looked at interim guidance for food service from the New York State Education Department. We've looked at guidance from the Academy of Pediatrics. We've looked at guidance from uh, nearby states, as well as states throughout the United States, including Maryland, California, and Missouri, as well as reopening plans in Massachusetts, Connecticut, and New Jersey. Uh, so these are all part of our uh, reopening task force assignments, uh, things that we're looking at for resources. In addition, we have met collaboratively with the Capital Region BOCES and our 24 United uh, School Districts in the area to better uh, formulate plans that are consistent uh, throughout the region. We understand that not all plans will be identical, but we're looking for consistency. So what you may see in a neighboring school district uh, may not be identical to South County's plan, but it should be similar. Um, and we're looking to present the best options for our, our students and our families in a timely manner. Uh, part of our uh, attempts to survey the staff and survey our community was to gain uh, feedback and information we will again continue to do that once we hear from the governor's office as to the reopening plans. We do anticipate a, a follow-up survey to our parents sometime between August 10th and August 20th, which will be asking specific questions related to your plans for utilization of transportation, as well as utilization of in-person versus remote environment. Should a parent choose to opt out of instruction in person, we will provide information as to how you can do that, what that process would look like, and keep in mind what that overall length of opt-out would be. At the present time, to opt out of in-person instruction most likely will be uh, a semester's length. So we will provide information once we uh, understand the governor's timeline for reopening. We will survey our parents between August 10th and the 20th, and at that particular time, we will be locking in our information for the reopening in September. Um, ultimately, uh, ways to communicate will continue to be uh, use of uh, email, our SNN system, our Blackboard Connect, that robocall system that you'll hear our voice should we have a snow delay or closure during the winter time, that's the Blackboard Connect system. In addition, uh, we will use a variety of social media platforms, including Facebook, to try to get the word out, as well as our building-based messages and our, our principals uh, and buildings do a great job in terms of communicating individual needs for those um, messaging and we'll continue that process. Uh, we will look to try to establish a consistent platform for our uh, virtual environment. Google Classroom will be one of those main priorities for uh, utilizing that. So we've used Google Meets. In the springtime, we'll continue to expand upon that as well as other platforms. That is an overview of our plan as of, of July 27th. Uh, Right now, I want to take a few moments to um, open it up to questions that were submitted, and I'll ask our, our panelists, both Mr. Dollar and Mrs. Penn, talk a little bit about 
um, what it may look like in their individual buildings related to some of the questions that have come up. So I'll start out with a um, uh, question for uh, Mrs. Penn. Um, you know, what will a typical classroom look like at the K-4 level at Forest Park for the fall? One of the things that we did first is we emptied out our classrooms and then um, went in and, and measured them out to see how far apart the desks needed to be, marked the floors to see how many student desks could safely fit in the classroom and allow for social distancing. Um, we're also already marking our floors to make sure that our kids know what directions they're going to be traveling when they're moving down the halls. Um, we have our hand sanitizers in the classroom. Uh, we're making sure that, you know, every day when the kids enter, because we do have students in session right now, um, that our classrooms are cleaned, they've been sanitized, and that the materials they used the day before are sanitized and ready for them to use the next day. Um, you also see staff using masks. We also do have um, some of our speech pathologists using face shields as well. When they're communicating with the kids and working with them at least six feet apart, they will just use the shield so that the students can see um, you know, the formation of the sounds that they're making just to help facilitate that instructional um, goal as well. Mrs. Penn, you, you touched upon that you have students in instruction currently. We have our extended school year program going on at Forest Park. Can you uh, talk a little bit about what you've done for any uh, high frequency uh, contact areas, uh, 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 toys or um, uh, items that you may use in a common setting, what you've done to disinfect and to properly uh, uh, social distance and make sure those are ready to be used the next day. Absolutely. Um, we grab those uh, copy paper boxes that usually are you know, scattered around the building and people are borrowing them when they're moving. Instead, now we have them in the classrooms and when items are utilized by the children, um, we put them right inside of those boxes so that we can make sure that the staff knows that they are not available for use after that point. Um, we have uh, disinfectant in every classroom along with um, cleaning supplies of towels and paper towels so that those can be wiped down uh, after they're used. We also are using our sharp boards right now. Um, so our kids are, are up using the intera interactional technology. They're washing their hands in between um, and we're making sure that those boards are cleaned down every evening so that we can disinfect them as well. Thank you very much. Manipulatives was the word I was looking for, but sometimes when you're live, uh, sometimes it doesn't always come to you. So exactly. We were all going to tell you. They come in the box. Yeah, they come so. in the box as well. Exactly. Um, Mr. Dollar, talk a little bit about yeah. what would a classroom look like at Shaker Road? Um, very much like what Mrs. Penn had to say. Uh, we have been in each room. We've measured it out. We're putting markings on the floor. Uh, we've dumped uh, most of the furniture out of there that we know is not going to allow us to responsibly social distance children. Uh, we're beginning to map out how we're going to mark out floors for pathways. The first days of school, the first weeks of school are all about teaching routines. And so uh, this school year, we'll obviously have some very different routines that we're going to be teaching in the classroom, in the hallways, on and off transportation, moving to, uh, say, PE, or if it's uh, you know, your day in the schedule that your uh, class might be going to the cafeteria. So all those things are you know, being front loaded now and considered now and marked out now so that when they get there, if the number is 15, if the number is 18, uh, we'll know, depending on the room, how many kids are going to be in there with that teacher and how they're going to go through their day. Okay. So, Mr. Dow, you, you touched upon that. Uh, talk a little bit about uh, class size adjustments. What have we done to uh, minimize the size of, of uh, the classes and things like that to, to date? Yeah, each building is different. Each building has you know, a different number of sections, classrooms. Uh, so when we built our schedules in June, Shaker Road had 16 sections. At this point, uh, in order to be sure that we can socially distance kids by group, we'll have at least 21 sections, an extra one per grade level. Uh, we'll have to see how it plays out with, uh, with families opting in and opting out in terms of uh, whether we're going to need those extra sections, where we're going to cite them, and how we're going to staff them. Uh, but we have lots of uh, wonderful certified people that are going to be part of teams that are going to coordinate things at each grade level for those kids. And uh, the continuity of instruction that you've talked so much about that's, uh, that's the primary purpose behind safety. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Penn, this one was uh, specific, but uh, how do we properly train a five-year-old to uh, socially distance? What kind of things would you foresee at Forest Park in terms of working with our youngest students? That's a great question. Um, prior to the kids even leaving, we obviously were already talking about COVID-19. So my kindergartners became very well versed, not in social distancing, because that was not a thing at the time, um, but in hand washing. So there are tons of resources that we found available. The teachers do a, um, a wonderful job teaching those routines. And one of the new routines that obviously we'll be teaching kids is 
how do you stay six feet apart? Um, we will have our markings on the floor, but more importantly, um, even when Mr. Dollard and I sat down today, we talked about, you know, put your arms out and what's the distance between um, you and the person next to you, and, and that helps you determine whether or not you're six feet apart. Um, but again, uh, I, I do have a great deal of uh, trust and faith in our staff. Uh, they work very hard to teach our kids, and this is an opportunity for us to teach them something that's going to help them to remain safe and to remain healthy. And uh, those routines will become part of what we do when we get back to school, and they'll be reviewed throughout the course of the year as well. Okay. Mr. Dollar, anything you want to add? Well, uh, as she said, you know, the whole idea uh, with, with kids this age is uh, modeling is pretty much the most effective way to teach kids this age. So uh, all our teachers and staff and everybody will be fully in uh, you know, demonstrating not only hand washing technique and mask on, mask off, but what social distancing means and how you practice it in the hallways, how you practice it when you're, say, uh, going to be going through a lunch line, going to recess, going to uh, PE back and forth, all those sorts of things where we're going to use every square inch of the building to responsibly social distance the kids. And, and what ways would parents be able to assist us in uh, teaching the students those protocols. The same kind of modeling that we're going to be asking and expecting our staff to do is, is something that people can practice at home. And I trust many families are already doing that now based on the kind of support we enjoyed during the shutdown. Uh, but, you know, the, the, the idea that you would repeat that and model it over and over, that you would uh, use different examples when you're, say, at the grocery store or visiting someplace, even a park, that you would be responsibly uh, social distancing yourself from other groups that you would be wearing a mask responsibly, that you'd be washing your hands as often as you can. Those sorts of things are uh, the kinds of uh, habits of mind that we're looking for parents to help us support their kids. I think mm -hmm. talking to the kids about and explaining why we're doing it is important. Um, we also, before the start of our extended school year program, sent home a social story that included some images of people wearing masks so the kids knew what to expect. And also um, that same social story talked about the importance of us wearing masks ourselves um, as students and as adults. So one of the questions that had come up is, uh, what if my child has difficulty breathing with a mask on due to anxiety? Um, so one of the things that will go on is that uh, we will provide some uh, practices with masks. We ask that parents try to reinforce that at home. Uh, we also work with our staff to provide for that social emotional support. We understand that uh, having somebody uh, wear a mask may be frightening to a young child. So explaining to them why the mask is important, how it helps to protect us and others uh, certainly be part of our messaging to students. Um, if there are, are medical reasons, then we will work with each individual child and their parent and their medical provider uh, on any potential exemptions related to, to masks at each level. So uh, very good question. Um, if masks are required um, in those six foot social distance environments, what would you see a, a teacher in a classroom uh, allowing students to do in terms of removing their mask to take a break from that? Well, after they've uh, you know, taught them the proper way to do that, uh, <laughs> then they'll uh, be sure that, uh, that the learning activity is going to be a static situation where the kids will be at their desk properly social distance. If there's any sort of transition, those routines that the students are learning, mask goes on, even if it's within the classroom. Uh, and teachers will find different ways to create small group instruction, socially distance with masks on, uh, and, and that, you know, inside the classroom, as people get more familiar with the routines and, and the expectations and understanding that it's a safety and we're a community, um, you know, it, we'll get it all worked out. We also have started to receive questions about, even from the kids, where will I put my mask when I take it off? Um, and one of the things that we're looking at are some of those suction cup hooks that you can put on the side of the desks. I know our PTA um, has already been contacted by some local um, agencies that are developing lanyards that have like a hook on the end. The kids could put their masks onto that. So there, there will be things that we'll be teaching the kids. I know I always, when I take mine off, I put it face down, um, you know, on my desk or in an area near my desk. Uh, that's something that we'll obviously have to include as part of that teachable process or moment that uh, we'll be providing instruction in each and every day. Yep. And have we been providing masks for students and the faculty? Mr. Rubel, you want to touch base on plans for that? Yep. We, uh, we purchased a large number of masks for students and staff uh, towards the end of last year and extended that order uh, over the summer to have uh, a large supply on hand for students that may need them. And we're also um, looking at some pricing for some cloth masks as well. Yeah, so we will continue to provide, we would encourage uh, students to have their own personal masks, but we will provide masks uh, for students and, and staff in the event that they do not have their own. 
making sure that they have the appropriate protective uh, face covering at all times available. Mm -hmm. um, this question was related to technology. Um, if a child does not have access to technology at home, um, and we were to go into a remote learning environment, what would a parent need to do in order to obtain uh, access or some support from uh, perhaps the IT department? Sure. But, uh, you know, what we did in the springtime during the shutdown, obviously, was that families communicated through their teachers to principals who then communicated to the IT department about uh, the sorts of things that, uh, you know, little processes they could follow to request not only assistance with using the technology, but if they needed technology on hand, that they could get some help. Uh, all principals spent a lot of time in the spring uh, running around trying to be sure that people had internet access in the first place. And, uh, you know, some companies stepped up and helped out, uh, but you have to really push. You have to be very uh, relentless to be sure that uh, somebody who wants to, say, borrow technology from the district has the access to do it. Uh, and if not, to look at, uh, you know, feasible alternatives to be sure that they can stay connected to the school. Absolutely. Mr. Penn, anything you want to add to that? No, I really do feel our IT staff went above and beyond. And if there was a time where they had delays and they couldn't get to or meet up with families, they would contact the principals. And I know a lot of times we were handing things in the hand for bags out the door um, to families. But, you know, certainly, as, as Mr. Dollard said, I think um, in every department, everyone really stepped up and, and did what they could to make sure our families felt supported um, and that they felt they were able to remain connected during the course of the closure. And certainly, um, I would expect that we continue that if, if we have that situation again. Okay. And I, I would also encourage so families, if you have questions about technology or need assistance with internet connectivity, please reach out to the district. Uh, there is a uh, IT help desk request form uh, immediately on the district website. But if for some reason you do not have access to that form, uh, call your building principal and we will try to put you in touch with the appropriate uh, community agency that can help to support get you that access. Uh, we want to make sure that those barriers to our students are, are removed as much as possible. Um, what might special area classes look like, Mr. Dowd? Would we have physical education in the fall? Uh, the way that we're kind of setting up phys ed now is uh, what we would say is a fair weather plan. Uh, Mr. McCulloch, Mr. Merchant, and I have designed, um, you know, a, a situation in our backyard where we color-coded a grid and we've established, uh, you know, uh, fitness routines and fitness exercises that kids will do in groups of four inside each of these two dozen boxes. Each box is 16 by 16 to replicate a four square uh, you know, court. And so that gives the kids plenty of social distance inside the box. We, you know, they time themselves and they rotate between there. We'll use it for recess as well. But we've also got a, a two site alternative inside the building if the weather's, uh, the weather's not conducive as far as PE goes. As far as art and music, then right now um, the plan is to have our art and music teachers work with the kids in the classrooms um, where they can remain socially distant. I know um, as we looked at our supply list at the end of the school year last year, we worked with our special area teachers to make sure if there were materials the students needed so that they could keep them themselves like crayons, they weren't sharing those items, that we included those so they would be available to the students during the course of their special area experience. Uh, but we will you know, continue to provide those supports or experiences for our students. I know that even during the course of the closure, um, in our special area folks were very involved and the kids love those opportunities and want to continue to make those available during the instructional day. Yeah. I know this is always an important question at the elementary level, but uh, how about recess? Do we anticipate uh, changes to recess, but yeah. still maintaining recess, correct? For sure. It'll be one of the few you know transitions that they will have in their day, yes. but it's it's necessary. For sure. Absolutely, absolutely. Sometimes we even uh, may consider double recess. <laughs> which day for our Encourage students. getting outside as much so, as possible. Mm -hmm. Uh, some of the questions that have come up were related to uh, safety drills. Uh, so I'll ask Mr. Rubelai to talk a little bit about, um, you know, what are our fire drills or lockdown drill requirements for the fall and how many that change at each level? So at this point, there hasn't been a reduction in the number of drills that we're expected to conduct. Uh, still eight uh, evacuation drills for the fall, um, four lockdown drills uh, over the course of the winter months typically is when they occur, and then four more evacuation drills in the spring. Uh, without a reduction in those regulations, then it would be us rethinking or repurposing or reimagining what a drill may look like in the K-6 level. Uh, for instance, we have control over what those drills look like and when they occur. So in order to maintain social distancing, we may want to look at our drills to be a little bit more educational in nature, maybe having more conversations with our students about what we would do or where we would go or what it would look like 
or even if we do evacuate, um, instead of evacuating the whole building at the same time, maybe we evacuate by wing uh, and do a couple classrooms and, and bring students to the spaces so they can see where they would go in all of the controlled environments uh, that we know we're doing a drill. Uh, for a, a lockdown drill, we wouldn't necessarily put all our kids in the corner of the room and eliminate the social distancing requirements, but we would have conversations about where you were, what did you hear, what did the words mean, and, and where did you go? Uh, I would uh, say in any instance where the alarm goes off in the building and we know it wasn't a planned evacuation, we would evacuate the building and put the safety of all of our students first. And once we get outside, then we would find the space, the distance as needed. But we're going to have to rethink those um, for this school year. Okay. So uh, one of the questions that was posed was uh, related to how will students that have allergies be accommodated? So this is Penny. Uh, can you talk a little bit about what that process may look like for student allergies if you're eating in a classroom? Certainly. Um, currently, our families always do a great job of communicating with the nurse's office anytime a child has a food allergy. Um, and the nurse then makes sure that all the staff that work in the cafeteria, including um, our support staff that come in during lunch in particular, know who those children are. Um, a lot of the kids, at least in our building at this time, are able to remain at the tables with their classmates. Uh, they just need to make sure that they're not eating anything or, or sharing food. And that's something that we stress throughout the course of the year. In the classroom setting, the same rules would apply. Um, one of the things that we'd obviously increase is after lunch, all of those desks would need to be cleaned again. Um, a lot of the times that we find uh, children who have food allergies in particular, if they're on a surface that uh, the food has you know, been exposed to, um, they can develop a rash. We want to make sure that we increase those protocol, uh, those cleaning protocol after lunch in the classroom. But just as we would during the school year, we'd make sure that the people supervising the classroom lunchtime are aware of who has allergies and um, make sure that you know, when the students are eating, they're still going to be at their desk, they'll be six feet apart. And actually, in many instances, I think they might be a little further away uh, in the classroom setting while they're eating lunch and, and provide some added protection for those with allergies. But we'll continue to make sure everyone's educated about who those individuals are. Very good. Thank you. Um, and one thing to talk a little bit about, uh, not only the uh, addressing the allergy concerns, but also if we're eating in a classroom, we're cleaning and disinfecting our uh, classrooms on a multiple level. Uh, just some things that uh, our operations and maintenance and custodial staff have been doing. They've been working with Negan Risk Management on uh, training protocols. They've uh, gone through multiple trainings related to COVID-19 and COVID-19 uh, related cleaning protocols. Um, all of our uh, Individual chemicals are, are safe, but designed specifically to kill the COVID-19 virus. Uh, we have um, uh, cleaning twice a day for classroom space, uh, high frequency touch locations such as railings, uh, lockers, uh, cubbies, uh, water fountains, uh, railings, uh, toilets and sinks. Uh, so increased uh, cleaning responsibilities, but um, just a simple thing, uh, will we be providing hand sanitizers for student or staff use? We do have those in all of the classrooms now, and we also have the elementary level the sinks. And one of the things that we talked about, obviously, is working that into the routine throughout the course of the day. Obviously, not just before the children eat, but you know, as we're teaching them about the routines, the new routine now is you're transitioning to a new activity, whether it's lunch or you know, if the librarian comes and you're, you're browsing some books that you brought, you're washing your hands before and you're washing your hands after just to minimize the spread of germs. Okay, and lastly, um, I know this is certainly an area that is uh, continued to be in development, and I'll throw it out to anybody, but how are we planning to address uh, some of the social emotional needs of our students uh, and their health? Um, so we'll start with maybe the elementary principals first and turn it over to maybe Mr. Olati, who I know has got some information related to some of our counseling initiatives. It's been a constant source of uh, interest and, and effort on the part of our teachers since we shut down in March. And they've, uh, you know, developed a very keen interest in finding community resources and linking kids and families to the sorts of things that they can uh, when you can't necessarily get together and address those sorts of things. So it's a constant topic of discussion. It has been all summer long and folks are prepared. They're preparing themselves to be able to identify, uh, you know, the sorts of things where kids are having social emotional issues or being able to support parents who uh, communicate, communicate about those kinds of things at home. So it's, uh, yeah, it's definitely a top shelf thing. 
no doubt about it. And our mental health um, providers, our school psychologists and social workers, were already starting to gather resources before. Um, when we were during the closure, we weren't really sure whether or not we'd be back. They had already started talking about that. Um, they have a plan in place. And I think the number one uh, thing that we need to do is just make sure that the staff are educated about some of the signs that the kids might demonstrate. Um, I think one of the things, particularly at the elementary level, you might see more acting out behaviors um, or behaviors that are not typical of an individual student that could initially be perceived to be uh, disciplinary in nature, but in reality are just a reflection of the anxiety that they might be feeling about coming back, um, seeing the adults wearing masks, not being able to um, you know, be in one another's space as much as they're used to being in their space. And, and that's something that I think could you know, result in some of those um, reactions that we might not um, be planning for if we're not being forward in our thinking. So just making sure that we're continuing our conversations about what we're seeing uh, and, and helping to educate our families as well, that they might see some different behaviors from the children and how they can support them uh, to help them feel comfortable and understand what's happening. That's going to be a huge part of what I think we're going to be working together on with our families and community. Thank you very much. Gentlemen, anything else you want to add? The community resources that the community resources that we were partnering with, I think Mr. Rivalotti's done some work on that, so you can speak to that. Yeah, we're, we're, yeah, the shape system, the shape system program. We have a, a committee of um, social workers, school counselors, uh, educators, administrators, parents um, involved in, in that program. We're going to take a look at our district and our offerings and kind of evaluate where we are and see where we can improve and, and enhance our offerings to our students as far as their mental health. Uh, anxiety, depression, things of that nature. Also, um, from a district um, initiative, we, we put out a training to our administrators on anxiety and depression related to the coronavirus. So when we get students back in our building, we can see those signs and sim symptoms that uh, Mrs. Penn had, had mentioned and start to address them early. We were working hard prior to COVID-19 with mental health issues, and we're going to work even harder uh, when we get back. This has certainly impacted our kids in, in a variety of ways. Okay. Any last comments from the committee? Uh, we're looking forward to having the kids come back. Um, I know when the children came this summer, um, they were excited to be with us. You could tell that they missed that routine as much as um, I know everybody loves those vacations. I think now the kids would rather be in session. So we were excited to have them. Um, the kids have adapted um, very quickly to the new routines. We certainly still have our moments where you can tell it's a bit overwhelming, um, but the staff is, you know, again, tailoring uh, their reactions to student behaviors, um, their expectations to meet what it is they're seeing in terms of those changing behaviors and, and academic needs that are, you know, um, presenting themselves right now. And uh, again, we're just looking forward to having them walk through the front door again. Yeah, kids need to and want to be back in school. And kids uh, are very, very willing to rise to the, uh, the challenge of being a community and, and taking up uh, the opportunity to support one another. And when they understand it's a safety issue to, uh, you know, be sure that they're doing what they're going to do to pull on the same rope with everybody else. So they'll do that best when they're in each other's company, for sure. Thank you. Anything else? So again, uh, we appreciate you taking the time to uh, watch the uh, presentation today. We will continue to build out our website with more information related to the reopening plans. Uh, the, the plans currently at K6 is in person. At 712 is a hybrid model. Uh, we will continue to work with families on uh, additional options as the governor uh, presents the reopening plan for New York State. Uh, this is all tied to the metrics in the region and uh, subject to governor's approval. So we thank you. Uh, we appreciate your flexibility. Uh, we appreciate your patience in helping us develop this plan and look forward to our continued work uh, in getting your children back into South County schools. So have a great afternoon. Thank you.